Well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to Creative Mornings for hosting this event uh, with the help, of course, of uh, Sports for Works and with the delicious food from, uh, from O4. <laughs> Today, um, I'm going to talk to you, as you know, about my experience with the Refugee Olympic team in Rio. That's how we're going to, to link a little bit uh, the team of refugees and sports with justice. And so, before starting, a little bit of context. In 2015, um, it was the, the height of the refugee crisis. We had 1.2 million asylum applications in Europe, which is the highest number in the last 20 years. And globally, the number of refugees increased by uh, 9 million uh, and, and surpassed 60 million. So it was, it was in this uh, difficult context that um, the president of the IOC announced at the UN General Assembly in October 2015 that for the first time ever, there will be a refugee Olympic team participating in the Olympic Games. Um, invitations to apply for the team were sent to all 206 National Olympic Committees and a press release was issued on the olympic.org. Um, here we go. We received a very high number of applications, as you can expect, a lot of athletes you know, very interested, refugees who could not participate previously in international competitions because of their status, uh, saw this as an opportunity to be able to participate in the Olympic Games. So we received applications from uh, these uh, national Olympic committees, international sports federations, national <coughs> federations, athletes, coaches. I mean, even one of the athletes who made the team, uh, it was actually his brother who sent us an email. <laughs> then, uh, so the number of requests, as I said, was very important. And this is when they asked me to join the project. They said, okay, we have hundreds of requests from athletes. Uh, Gonzalo, can you get on the project? Uh, I was just finishing my previous contract with the IOC, so the timing was perfect. And so I was lucky to join this, this very interesting project. And so once, we, once I got to work, I started saying, OK, we have these hundreds of applications. We have to analyze them. We have to look at their sporting level. We have to look and confirm if they are refugees. And so we did this uh, for the sporting level in partnership with the International Sports Federations. And for the refugee status, uh, this was most of the work. We had to contact UNHCR, who then contacted the local government where the refugee was hosted to get a confirmation that this athlete was a refugee, a recognized refugee. Selection process. So um, we had all these athletes. We just you know, only selected the ones who were recognized by UNHCR as refugees. And then we looked at their level. Uh, so we selected, pre-selected a long list of 43 athletes coming from 10 different countries. And we supported them. It was already March. I mean, as you can imagine, only four months before the Games. So we provided them all the support they needed to be able to focus on their training for the last four months before the Olympic Games. And on the 3rd of June, um, 10 athletes and their entourage were selected by the <coughs> IOC executive board. And uh, so they brought their coaches and the IOC selected a lot of the officials who were accompanying it. So chef de mission, people in, in charge of the communication, etc. Just like a regular National Olympic Committee during the Olympic Games. Here is the team. Uh, so I guess most of you know them. Uh, so I'm going to go through it uh, quite quickly. Yusra Mardini, and she's a swimmer from Syria, based in Germany. She's probably the most famous of, of them. She, uh, a book about her life has been released last year, and there's a movie in the making uh, by the same director as uh, Billy Elliot, the, mo the famous movie. Um, Yolande Bukazamabika, she's um, from Democratic Republic of Congo. She's actually training in Rio de Janeiro, uh, and uh, yeah, so a judo athlete. Popole Misenga, also a judo athlete from Democratic Republic of Congo, training in the same center in Rio de Janeiro. Ramianis, swimmer from uh, Syria, just as Yusra, uh, he uh, is living in Belgium. And Jonas Kinde, who is uh, a marathon runner uh, from Ethiopia, 
uh, training in Luxembourg. So these are the individual uh, scholarship holders that we had because we provided them a scholarship. And this is the other half of the team. It's a group that all come from the same uh, center. It's a foundation in Kenya, the Teglalo Rupe Foundation. Um, Tegla Rupe, for those who don't know her, she's one of the most famous uh, African athletes. She's the first one who won the New York Marathon. I think she won it three times. She had multiple world records. I think even one of them is still standing to this day when she was competing in the 90s. And so these uh, five athletes were selected as part of the group of 30 who train in this uh, foundation. And uh, the selection happened in only one day because, I mean, as you see, uh, the, the team was selected in June. We had a month and a half. Uh, you know, and I mean, the long list actually in March, we had three months to the selection. And so we had to, you know, to try and, and see what the last result is to bring the best athletes out of those 30. So in one day, they did a, a trial and the best ones on the day got to Rio and were selected. And uh, so here is where I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference also between the two groups, because these two groups, um, it, it's quite different from the one I've previously mentioned. I can go back to it, but uh, Yuzra, she, well, you know, living in Germany, it was very easy for her to reach Rio. Um, she could just travel with the German delegation, so the transportation was very easy. Uh, Yolande Bukaza and, uh, and Popole Misenga, uh, very easy as well. They just had to take a bus, you know, to go to the Olympic Village, basically. Uh, Rami traveled with the Belgian uh, delegation, Jonas with the Luxembourgese delegation. And it was just easy. Also, they have this uh, as refugees. Sometimes it's difficult, but for the Olympic Games, it's not because they all have an accreditation. And this accreditation uh, that all athletes have serves as a visa entry into the country. So they don't even need to make an application for, for a visa. In Brazil, they know if they come with the accreditation for the Olympic Games, uh, they'll be able to, to enter the country without any problems. However, for, uh, for this group, uh, it was a lot more difficult. In Kenya, um, the refugee situation is a bit more complicated. They don't live individually in their house. They live actually in a camp that is also managed by UNHCR. UNHCR had a special deal with Tegla uh, that they could take them out of the camp, but they UNHCR still had to have some management side in that camp. So they can't leave this camp. They can train, they can go to school during the day, but they have to go back to the camp and stay there. And so. One of the complications also for them was that uh, they didn't have any ID to travel because this is not something that regularly happens, that refugees are you know, just allowed to travel. So we had a month and a half from the selection time uh, to get passports or ID pass, whatever we could get you know, to, to travel to Rio because in their case, unfortunately, there was no direct flight from Kenya to Brazil. That would have you know, made it easy because again, with their accreditation, they would have been able to enter straight away. Um, so I spent most of my month of June on the phone with the UNHCR office in Kenya, you know, telling them every day, is this ready? Uh, are the passes ready? You know, because actually those passes are not real passports. They're travel documents, which refer to uh, the convention of UNHCR 1951. And, you know, for me, when I saw this, I said, well, uh, is the border agent in South Africa? Because that's where we had to go to before going to Brazil. Is he going to accept this? Are we going to be able to board the plane? Uh, another other things is that actually this pass was handwritten. There was no <laughs> information. So I said, well, with this pass handwritten, I think it's going to be difficult, you know? Uh, and so luckily my director thought the same and said, okay, well, Gonzalo, you're not supposed to, you know, it's supposed to be a backup help here in Lausanne, but I think we really need to make sure that these athletes make it to Rio. So I'm going to send you and you're going to go and pick them up and then you're going to go with them to Rio. So this was, of course, the best, uh, the best news I ever had. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, yeah, of course, uh, I'm going on a plane. Uh, I'm going to go and get there, you know, and make sure they get to Rio. So I hopped on a plane, got to uh, Nairobi, and there I met, I met them. Uh, you know, they were in their camp, uh, which um, you can't see it so well here with the light, but on the top left, so that's where they're staying. Is this camp uh, outside of Nairobi in a city called uh, Ngong. And uh, as you can see, I mean, I just took that picture when I arrived. We were there ready with their UNHCR polos, ready to go. All UNHCR office was there, you know, ready to help in case there was a problem in Nairobi airport. 
So I felt very safe there. I said, okay, at least we're going to be able to get out of Nairobi, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, is here. Uh, and so we passed the control in the airport. And as soon as we did, I had some uh, uh, polos with Olympic rings ready, you know. I just wanted to get them in the mood, you know. We're going to the Olympic Games. Take off your UNHCR shirt, put on the, uh, the Olympic rings, and, you know, we're going to go to the Olympic Games. And um, here is a little funny story. Uh, bottom left, you can see here is uh, Rose and Popole, who were upgraded to business class on their first ever flight. <laughs> they travel business. <laughs> And so there's a little story behind it, is that um, for a lot of them, they have, well, first name, middle name, last name. And when I received the information about their names, actually, they mixed the middle name and the first name. So I had to rebook a flight ticket because we were so close, you know, and we took it without cancellation, cancellation fee. So we had to actually repay for a full ticket for both of them. But luckily for them, I think this is what made the difference. The airline probably saw it and said, okay, well, you've paid for two times for the ticket. We're going to upgrade you. <laughs> so, so they were really happy about it. Uh, the coach, the coach, and the manager of the camp a bit less because they were back in the economy. And I said, uh, "Can we go? Can we exchange?" Like she said, "No, no, no. This is how it happened. You know, they have to be in business." And here at the bottom right is um, our arrival at um, the Rio airport, as you can see. Uh, so here, yeah, I guess you can see with the light. There's a lot of journalists. They were, everyone was waiting for us. Uh, we were just you know, going through the doors and there you see all the journalists in front of you and what happened there was a bit uh, difficult because all of them read their names, you know, they knew who they were, so they started calling them. They said, Paolo, come here, James, Rose, and then, you know, they're so polite. And they, so they, of course, they went straight away. <laughs> they went there, you know, oh, I'm gonna, you know, he knows my name, I'm gonna introduce myself, you know, and, and actually uh, I was there around, you know, trying to get them into the bus to go to the Olympic Village, but you could see that you know, they wanted to answer to these people because they're so polite and stuff. And, and the journalists were asking very difficult questions. I remember getting close to one of them and he was saying, oh, can you tell us what do you think about the corruption cases in Brazil? What do you think, you know, about what's happening in the village? Have you seen some of the things are not ready? You know, all of it is very complicated. And they were there trying to answer, oh, I don't know, I'm just uh, happy to be here. And I was like, okay, let's, so I got uh, basically all the volunteers I could get. Uh, like you can see one of them there in yellow. Uh, and I said, guys, you need to help me there. Like, you know, keep those uh, journalists out of the way. We need to get into the bus and into the village. And uh, so we did. We finally, after, you know, wrestling almost with some of those journalists who were really following us, uh, we got to the Olympic village. And uh, then, you know, it was for them, of course, I mean, you can imagine, you know, they leave, especially from the ones from Kenya, they leave, uh, you know, from their camp in Nairobi and they get there with athletes from all over the world, very famous athletes with all these new buildings, you know, nice food and all of that. And they really enjoyed it. And for us, um, one of the worries was that, uh, you know, maybe the pressure is going to be too big. You know, they've never been on the world stage uh, uh, like the Olympic Games. So we didn't know, you know, how they were going to compete. We really tried to make uh, spirit, you know, team spirit, you know, we tried to bring everyone together, we had some dinners together, we spoke together, we really wanted to show that we are there to help them. And this is, uh, you know, one of the moments when they really impressed us because every one of them performed extremely well. Some of them, a lot of them beat their personal best. Here is just a selection of, of three of them. Poor here, you can see on the left, he beats his personal best by a significant margin in 800 meters. You have Popole who uh, actually won his first fight. Uh, and, you know, he never competed at an international level first. And uh, he, he won his first fight against uh, someone who, I think, made it fifth at the Asian Olympics, at the Asian Games. And so then, uh, then he got into a second fight versus the world champion in title. So that was <laughs> unlucky. But even against him, he was really impressive for four minutes. Uh, they were tied. And it was just decided he just lost in the last 20 seconds or something. So very competitive, had a very, very impressive performance. And uh, below is Yusra Mardini, who also won her first race, actually. And so we were really, really happy and impressed by how they could perform under that pressure. Uh, a little bit uh, more about you know, their participation outside of uh, you know, competition. You can see on the left, top left. So this is every time we went out of the village. You know, you could actually see Michael Phelps walking past. No worries. No, no, we want to talk 
about you know refugees so you could see all of them you know joining us making a huge circle and it was almost impossible to get them out so I always i had to look out for volunteers guys help me you know we need to we need to get them out let them get to you know where they need to go on the top right you can see this is during the the opening ceremony it was a very very beautiful moment because actually uh, i was there in the stadium i mean i know that some of you were as well and the Brazilian, uh, you know, the Brazilian public really took them as their second team. So the cheers in the stadium when they arrived were really, really impressive. Um, you could feel that they were really welcome. You know, people were very happy that they were there. Um, bottom left, some of the you know, high level visits that we had during the games. You can see here in the middle holding the image is uh, uh, former UN Secretary, Gen Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And uh, the former IOC president, um, Jacques Rogge. Uh, and on the bottom right, uh, another of these uh, you know, nice moments for Pur, who and all of them loved football. Mm -hmm. And here they are with uh, superstar Neymar from Brazil, mm -hmm. captain of the team who actually won the gold medal during these Olympic Games with his home crowd. So you can imagine uh, how happy he was to meet him. So after Rio, um, we continued, of course, supporting these 10 members. We continue supporting them to this day, and we're going to continue in the future, not only with sports, but with education, because, of course, they cannot compete um, forever. At some point, they're going to have to you know, go into education, find a job, and so we are supporting them with this. And especially, they're doing a great work also now, because they've been you know, on the media and all over the world. They're doing a really great work on advocacy on behalf of refugees worldwide. And this is just an example of, uh, of some of them. So you, here you see Pur talking at the UN General Assembly in New York, uh, you know, in front of leaders of all the countries. You can see Rose up there with Pope Francis at an event in Rome. And Yusra in a meeting one-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, former President Barack Obama. Just a few words about what we're doing now. So after the Games, you know, this was a special project. It was just for the Rio 2016 Olympic Games. It was a success and of course the IOC wanted to continue uh, supporting these athletes. So a new program was created uh, for Olympic Solidarity, which is a program that focuses exclusively on supporting refugee athletes continue their sporting career. We still work with the same partners, National Olympic Committees and uh, UNHCR, and this is uh, the budget for this program. Uh, quickly a few examples about you know, what other international sports federations are doing, because the IOC is not alone in, in supporting that. And so here are three examples, and I just wanted to show that you know, all the international federations, they wanted, a lot of them wanted to support this cause, and they just you know, decided how they would want the teams to be named, and so they all named it here, for example, in a different way. So you can see the International Athletics Federation, uh, when a team of refugees participate, they are called the Athlete Refugee Team. For the World Taekwondo, it's just the World Taekwondo Refugee Team. And FINA, which is the Swimming International Federation, they participate under the independent athletes. Here's just a selection of the World Championships that are, have happened this year. And in all of them, for example, for Taekwondo, every single Taekwondo scholarship holder under the program I just talked about participated in that team. Uh, Yusra and Rami were the FINA independent athletes at the World Championship this year. And again, four or five of the, our refugee scholarship holders will participate next month in the World Championships of Athletics in Doha. So this is the part about, I mean, globally, you know, refugee Olympic team, what everyone knows, you know, that's been in the media and all that. And I just wanted to talk quickly about some of the local uh, projects that are supporting refugees. Nico uh, Campriani, who started this, uh, this project, he um, contacted me uh, more or less a year and a half ago. He told me, Gonzalo, I know that you've worked on the Refugee Olympic team. Uh, I have this project. I want to um, you know, select and train two local refugees in the sport of shooting with the goal to manage to qualify them for the Olympic Games. And needless to say, I heard this. I said, wow, let me know. What can I do? It's amazing. I love this project. And uh, of course, well, what we had to do was to find the refugees, local refugees, you know, with talent, enough talent for, you know, to be able to start a new sport and manage to reach a level uh, that, uh, you know, would allow you to qualify for Olympic Games in only a year. And so I started this project. Uh, I started contacting the sports authorities here in the Canton Vaux. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know them. Uh, 
they told me, oh, that's amazing, I want to do it, I'm going to get you in touch with the Service de la Population, who is in charge here of just all the foreigners in the Canton de Vaud. Uh, love the project as well, say, let me get you in touch with the people in charge of uh, refugees here in uh, Lausanne. And these two organizations are uh, here, EVAM, which stands for Etablissement Vaudois d'Accueil des Migrants, which is for migrants or me uh, refugees, um, asylum seekers, people who are accepted temporarily, and the CIR, which is the Centre Social d'Integration des Refugiés, which really sp so sp supports specifically uh, recognized refugees in Switzerland. So we sat with them, you know, they uh, love the project. Also, they said, they're gonna, we're going to contact local refugees here, uh, you know, and we're going to let the, them, you know, you know, who is interested to, participation, to participate in the selection day. And so we, you know, this started around September 2018. So they started contacting them. We started receiving, you know, replies from refugees here, you know, were interested, very interested in the project. They wanted to be there, the selection day. So Nicolo and I, spent quite some time meeting them, you know, in the coming, uh, in the weeks uh, that were, you know, going towards uh, the March 2019 selection day. And we quickly found out that uh, there was a difficulty of finding uh, women who were interested. Everyone who was interested was, uh, was a man. And uh, in the meantime, the Olympic Channel heard about the story. They got, you know, they were absolutely, you know, uh, pleased, uh, you know, to to, uh, the, to be involved in this project. So they said, you know what, we want to do a series about this. We want to film this. This is going to be amazing. Uh, but you really need to find a woman. So we were going, we were going uh, uh, you know, trying every way. I was contacting some of the, the, the local organizations I work with, you know, to find, try and find that. And in the end, after a talk we gave to, uh, to the social, uh, social um, center for refugees here, where Nicolo actually explained really what, what this sport was about, that this is what made the difference. Because we, we saw when we did a talk with uh, the social workers uh, who are in charge of actually the refugees directly. They have all of them 30 to 40 refugees that they see every month. And so they're really the person we have to convince in order for them to then convince those refugees, you know, that this is a project that, you know, can really, uh, you know, help you uh, integrate through sports and maybe have a possibility to participate in the games. And so this, this work, Nicolo, when he talks about the sport, you know, you're, you're convinced straight away. And so they went from thinking, uh, you know, what he said in the first sentence, and sometimes it's tricky to put the word, you know, refugees and arrival together, to, uh, and that's how it was perceived in the beginning when we got there, to then, you know, saying, well, actually, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's great for them. It's a way to, you know, to, to participate in the life here, to, to be in sports and to maybe reach the Olympic Games. So we got uh, women participating and in the end, and so as you can see, there's almost a gender parity. Uh, this is a picture from the selection day. And in the end, uh, I mean, in terms of for the men, it was clear uh, that he was really head and shoulders about everyone else. He was an exceptional talent. So we selected the one who was on the right standing there. Uh, I mean, we, it's Nicolo uh, who selected because I don't know about the shooting. And, uh, and uh, two women in the end were selected because the one who was first selected uh, was a young mother. So she, her child was two months old and we didn't know if she was going to be able to commit really to the training that you need in order to make it to the, to the games. So I selected a, a second woman and the other one in pink and in white in that picture. You won't be able to see really their faces from here. Uh, and uh, the training uh, after that selection now takes place three times a week at the World Atri Center in Chalet d'Agobert, which is an amazing partner. They've been very supportive since the beginning and they leave uh, that space for them to train. So they could even go uh, at any time during the day and they could just, you know, train as much as they want there. We're really lucky to have found uh, these partners. Um, and then just to finish uh, quickly, because I know I, I'm probably over time, <laughs> we, uh, I just want to talk about two organizations here who support refugees, so outside of the world of sport this time. Uh, it's uh, Power Coders, um, so it's an organization that started, I think, two years ago in Bern, and they teach refugees how to code uh, with the goal of then, uh, you know, helping them get a job in IT, because as uh, most of you know, uh, you know, there's a huge need for uh, IT jobs, IT positions to be filled and refugees, because coding is something that is a bit niche, you know, I, I didn't learn it in school, I guess a lot of you didn't either. So we all start from the same level, a bit like with sports. Uh, and so they started learning to code and they could do this in three months and then they would get an IT internship. 
And I think that uh, more or less half of them already found a job straight away after that, uh, uh, that internship. So it's, it's very successful. You have the city of Zurich, uh, the government, all of them are behind it, a foundation, etc. It's really, really working really well. And they're looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in supporting this case, uh, you can just go on their website uh, and there all the information will be there. In, in there. And um, the other last organization is PER. They're based here in Lausanne, and they basically pair you up with a local refugee uh, if you want to support, you know, help with language courses or just, you know, have a coffee and, you know, hear from them and maybe help them. Uh, you can, so you just, you know, contact them, then you'll go to a, a meeting, they'll talk with you, explain you what it is, and then they'll send you, you know, the contact of this local refugee. And so then, what is great there, and I've been doing it also, I've been uh, paired up with one of the refugees, and uh, is that you can decide how much time you want to spend with them. You can, you know, say, well, let's have a coffee and we see, you know, or let's have a coffee every few weeks or and you can go to the next level. You can help them with a, the with a language, you can help with integration, with preparing a CV, etc. So it's really up to you. You decide how much time you want to spend with them. So if you want to help, this is a very good start. Finally, and just to end some, some reflections I had for, you know, after three and a half years working on this project, I just wanted to put a few of them down there. Um, so is that the, the Refugee Olympic team really, I mean, helped to bring the, the, spot, the spotlight on the plight of refugees and their immense potential if they're given a chance. Because to link this again back to the theme of justice, I mean, all of them suffered big injustice. They weren't, you know, uh, they weren't guilty of, uh, you know, their houses or neighborhoods being bombed, you know, during a war and having to go and, and, and fear for their lives and, and, and travel outside. So this was an injustice upon them. And through sports, this can be changed as an opportunity. Uh, and they can really prove, if you give them that opportunity, they can really prove uh, you know, their immense potential. Um, sport has a unique role to play in the integration of refugees because everyone is considered equal on the sporting level, uh, on the sporting uh, field. Um, and uh, despite their fame, um, their status uh, as refugees, unfortunately, continues to limit their opportunities. Um, so, if I give the example of the refugees in Kenya, they had to go back to the same camp where they were. There was no possibility for them to get out of it because they're still refugees and the government of Kenya will still want them to be in, uh, in that camp. So, you can imagine, I mean, they've been there with, with everyone, with Neymar, with superstars, you know, with media all over the world, but they had to go back to the same camp. Uh, and um, finally, yeah, the political rhetoric. Uh, around refugees has changed um, for the bad, unfortunately, since 2015. And so projects like the Refugee uh, Olympic team are more important than ever. And uh, as you, most of you know, uh, there will be another refugee team in Tokyo. Um, and so I just wanted to end also this, this talk with a quote from, from the guy that you saw in the video, Mahdi, the man that was selected in the project Taking Refuge. And it's really what I felt after working with them for, for more than three years now. And is that the, the only difference really between uh, a refugee and a normal person is the story of their home. And um, yeah, and with that, I end my talk. And um, please, if you have any questions, do not hesitate. I'm also going to stay around here a little bit. And Nico graciously offered to stay also a little bit more. So if you have questions about taking refuge, Please don't hesitate, he's the source of all, all the information. Mm -hmm. <laughs>